God is good. And all the time, he so is, so is. And so we are walking through this series called All In. I want to encourage you to open up your bulletin if you have one. And of course, all the notes will be in there. So thankful for you who are worshiping with us online. I encourage you to grab something. You can write some things down. I hope there's going to be some real encouraging thoughts shared that will bless you. And we're talking about going all in. All in for God. And I've, I've said this, I'll probably say it here every week. There's just no other way to live for God. You know, a halfway disciple is just a religious person, and that's a miserable place to live, okay? You got to go all in. I mean, that's just the way it is. We're called to let go of what's behind and go all in with Jesus. And uh, last week, we we talked about being all stars for Jesus, right? Philippians 2, how when we work out our salvation with fear, reverent fear and trembling, he fills us with the power and the desire to do what pleases him, and we shine like stars, in a dark sky, in this crooked and warped world, Paul says. Literally, his words, not mine. And uh, what a beautiful picture. Today we're going to talk about being one-way missionaries. Another way to think of that is one-way ambassadors for Jesus. People who, as that passage we read from Acts 10 said, people who, who proclaim to the world that Jesus has come to, uh, to offer us peace through, through belief in him. So let me start with this little story about a fellow named A.W. Milne. Uh, a couple generations ago, he was called by God to be a missionary to a tribe of head, headhunters, okay, uh, in a place called New Hebrides. And I hope I said that right. If you guys are uh, folks who know geography and those old words, let me know if I got that close. Uh, but it's a group of islands in the South Pacific, just off the east coast of Australia. Today, it's called Vanuatu or Vanuatu. Anyway, it's it's over there, you know, kind of in that area, and. Um, The point is, all the missionaries who'd gone there previously were martyred. They were all killed by this this tribe of of headhunters and uh, died for the cause. But Milne found favor among the people. And he lived there for 35 years among the tribe, never went home. And when he died, the tribe buried him, and they inscribed these words on a small tombstone. When he came... There was no light, but when he left, there was no darkness. What a beautiful story. You know what? I think that that, that we all, there's something in every single one of us when we hear a story like that that is tugged, our heartstrings are tugged. We we recognize that as, as something we would all aspire to. Not necessarily being overseas missionaries, although if God calls us to do that, we step in. But, but just to be one-way missionaries, and ambassadors for Jesus, all in for him, wherever we work, wherever we live, among our family, in our life. We recognize that as the epitome of this, this devotion that we want to walk in. So last week we talked about being all-stars. This week we're going to talk about being one-way missionaries, and I hope that you're really going to fully get that. And we're going to look at the, the life of Moses who was an all-star, one-way missionary in his generation in the Old Testament. I I believe his life is going to inspire us. We're going to draw our our thoughts from Hebrews chapter 11. Now, if you're you're familiar, Hebrews 11, I call it all the time, and Bible students for years have called it the Hall of Faith. And if if you're into music, if you're into sports or anything like that, you know what a Hall of Fame is. Right? It's where the, the all-stars, the best of the best, they, they get commemorated for all of us to remember their great deeds right? in the Hall of Fame. Well, the Hall of Faith is the Bible's place where all of the all-stars of the Old Testament, all of those who lived in this wonderful, sold-out way for God by faith and, and under the Old Covenant, lived for Him. And in Hebrews 11, verses 24 through 27, we read about the life of Moses. Hebrews 11, verse 24. By faith, and I'm telling you, repetition is the mother of memory, and it's a good thing to hear again and again, that faith is not a warm, fuzzy feeling. It is trust that obeys. That's what faith is. So we could say, by a trust that obeys God. Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You got to get the context here. Moses, literally, in the world's eyes, had it made. 
I mean, he was a prince of Egypt. If you, if you don't know the story, he was born at a time when all of God's people were slaves in Egypt. Had been for nearly 400 years at this point in history. Uh, and his, uh, or the, the Pharaoh was fearful, that's the whole reason he enslaved them, but he was fearful that the Hebrews who were increasing in numbers would rise up at some point, especially if Egypt was ever attacked, join with their enemies and overthrow Egypt. And so at this point he was especially afraid because there were so many young men being born. He gave this edict, and it kind of reminds us of Matthew chapter 2 and King Herod at the time that Jesus was born. He gave a similar edict during Moses' time, Pharaoh did, that all of the Hebrew boys that were born were to be killed. And it was at this time that Moses' mother gave birth to him. And she recognized, of course, right away that he was a healthy young boy, and she did everything she could to hide him as long as she could. And then when it got to the point where she could no longer hide him, prayerfully she wrapped him in a cloth, put him in a, a basket of reeds, put some pitch on it to waterproof it a little bit, and set it down on the edge of the Nile. I said, God, I'm giving him to you. <laughs> you know, can you imagine as a mother doing this? But it's her only option. She laid him down there, and in God's sovereign, wonderful providence, the daughter of Pharaoh just happened to come to that spot to bathe one morning, found the child, instantly had a, a connection with him, loved him, brought him into the home, and he was raised as a prince of Egypt. The best of everything. The Egyptians at the time were one of the most advanced. They were the most advanced people on the planet. He, he had the, the greatest education there was. He was surrounded by wealth. He was surrounded by servants. He was surrounded by power. I mean, he, he, he had everything from a world's perspective you could have. The only problem with all of this was that every single part of, of all that he had was nothing but a roadblock or a stumbling block to living for God. He, Moses, as a prince of Egypt, when he came to that place where he realized at one point he learned that he was raised in a Hebrew home, born to a Hebrew family, and, and, and he, there was just something innately in him, let's just, just you know, Label it the, the call of God on his life. But he was drawn to want to follow the Lord and be part of his people, and he realized just instantly, that I don't have the option as a prince of Egypt to just live out my faith here in the palace, in God. You couldn't do it. See, Egypt was thoroughly polytheistic. That means they worshipped all kinds of gods. They had over a hundred what were considered major gods, Gods that were over big swaths of their life. They would have a God for this, a God for that, and they would sacrifice to it and pray to it. And then they had countless minor gods. I mean, any aspect of their life, they would have a God over all of it, hoping that that God would help that part of their life go well. Pharaoh himself was, was seen as deity, and he was worshipped. God of the, of the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and his kingdom were directly opposed to Pharaoh and his kingdom. Pharaoh had enslaved God's people. There were, there was, there, there were, there were 180 degrees apart. There was no both in for, for Moses. He recognized this readily, and he made the decision to turn away from all that he had and go all in with God. And, and what I really want you to kind of see is that that is an image of conversion for us today. When we come to know or hear the gospel, and God opens our eyes and we understand the reality of what Christ did for us, we're at the same place Moses was. We may not be a prince of Egypt or whatever, but we all have things that tie us to our world and to this world and to the things that we have and all of that. And in that moment, we all have to understand, what do I need to let go of? Because I'm called to turn away from that, from that life and from any attachments in this world and turn to God and go all in and follow him. That's exactly what Moses did. That's what everyone under both covenants chose to do. To say, God is my God. Moses' example challenges us to ask that question, is there anything I need to turn away from today in order to go all in? Now, I'm sure that Moses had a lot of voices around him in the palace. 
And I'm sure that he didn't just decide this on a whim and do it. And as it began to kind of eke out that Moses is thinking about leaving, Moses is going to walk away. You know there had to be people who were like, dude, Moses, you got it all. You snap your fingers and 30 people come. You can do anything. You're going to walk away from all of this? And Moses said, yeah, I'm going to let go. I'm going all in with God. Hebrews 11, verse 25. He chose. I love that word. I have that underlined and highlighted the word chose. Listen, there's so many words in this verse that are so great. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures. Well, that'd be a good couple of words to underline. The fleeting pleasures of sin. Anyone who tells you there's no pleasure in sin is lying. Okay? There is. But it's fleeting pleasure. The the pleasures of sin last but a moment, but the consequences last all of life and into eternity if we don't repent of them. Right? That's huge. And he chose. Free will is a gift of God. God has granted us. He didn't have to. He chose to grant us free will. You can do what you want with your life. You can choose to go the direction you want to go with your days. And many people have chosen to fill their life by choosing the pleasures, the fleeting pleasures of sin. Just doing whatever makes them happy in the moment. But free will is also the key or a key to our relationship with God. Please understand, this is, this is one of the beautiful ways that us being made in God's image, we can understand this. Nobody wants someone to love them because they're told to. I don't know if you remember this in grade school, one of the most painful things in the whole world was not being chosen. And then for the teacher, I mean, this is like so embarrassing. I'd rather crawl in a hole and die, right? For the teacher to come up and say, now, you boys be nice to Brad. You let him play with you. (laughs) You're like, oh, thanks a lot. I'd rather just run away, right? Nobody wants to be made to be accepted. God doesn't want us to love him. He could make us, but that's not love. That's not relationship. We want our kids, okay, they're both out of the nest now. Woohoo! They're both, they both got their own nest, Karen and Josh. We don't want them to come because we make them. We want them to come visit us, and we want to be with them because they want to be with us, right? And so God gives us this free will, and it's a key to us having a relationship with God. And, and this, is, this is mind-blowing. This really came to the forefront as I was preparing this week. I want you to know something. If you don't already know this, I really want you to feel this. God has chosen you. Let that sink in. He's chosen you. He wants you to know him. He wants to be part of your life. He knows everything about you. He knows all the parts that nobody else in this room knows about you that you don't want anybody to ever know about, and he still chose you. Okay? How do we know that? This Nothing says I choose you like the cross. Jesus laid it all out for us. And and the only thing kind of left now is for you to choose him. Have you chosen him back? He's reaching out. Have you reached back? John chapter 3, verse 16. It's been called many times the gospel in a nutshell. God so loved the world. Now listen, this is one of those verses that sometimes we get so familiar with that we don't really think about what the phrases in it mean. For God so loved the world. For years I used to think this, that this phrase meant God loved the world so much. That's not what it's saying. And a better way to translate this first phrase is God chose to love all of humanity in this way. This is how God showed his love. It, the emphasis isn't on a feeling, it's on the action of God, Okay. God chose to love the world this way. He gave us his son. He gave us his only son. So that whoever, and that would include you, put your name there, 
Whoever would choose, we could say, whoever believes, pistuo, trusts in, clings to, and relies upon him, will not have to perish, will not have to be separated from God, but can have eternal life of God, forever life in relationship with him. He's chosen you. Have you chosen him back? <laughs> Hebrews eleven twenty six. Moses, I'll just say Moses, it says he... Uh, Regarded, so many good words. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ. Isn't that an interesting phrase? He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. I'd rather face scorn in this world because I'm not living for this world, I'm living for that one, right? I'm living in this life for that world. He says he chose uh, disgrace for the sake of Christ and chose it as greater value than uh, the treasures of Egypt because he was looking forward to his reward. That's how we live. That's how we live in this world. Discipleship is the ultimate delayed gratification journey. Right? I mean, man, if you've ever worked out, if you've ever had a goal and you're like, I want to get in shape or I want to achieve this thing or I'm working toward my retirement or whatever, you understand the concept of, okay, I'm not enjoying the spoils at the moment, but I'm working, I'm, I'm involved in the process, I'm working toward that thing. That's discipleship. Oh, we have joy in the moment. God is with us. He walks with us through it all. But so much of our joy is understanding that we're moving toward that day. The mindset of an all-in disciple is driven by an eternal perspective. Every choice we make, every step we take, we're processing it through. Is this moving me in the direction of honoring God? My, my theme verse in life, you've heard me say many times, is 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. The, the, verse 16 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. Every year I figure out that a little bit more. But inwardly we're being renewed day by day. And then in verse 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And so here's how we live. We fix our eyes, the eyes of our heart, the eyes of our mind, all of our affections, <laughs> uh, not on what is seen. Because what is seen, temporary. Passing, passing, passing. What is unseen is eternal. That's how we live. That's how Moses chose to live. In verse 27 then, we see the beautiful fruit of Moses' choices. Hebrews eleven twenty-seven. By this trust that obeys God, he left Egypt, not, I love this, not fearing the king's anger. It's hard for us to really understand the power of Pharaoh he was the ruler of the world at the time. It was the most powerful nation in the world. And, and just picture Moses walking out. That's kind of simplistic. It didn't happen just exactly like that, but that's the idea that the Hebrew writer is conveying. He walked away from it, not fearing the anger of Pharaoh. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love. Now, to get this, you've got to understand that this whole chapter in 1 John is about love. And 10 verses before this verse, John said, God is love. It's his nature. It's who he is. Again, it's so, got to be reminded again and again and again in this 21st century in which we live, love is not a warm, fuzzy feeling. Love is not, oh, I feel really nice and warm toward God. That's not love. When God sent his son, it wasn't, oh, I just have this affection. I mean, he does, but that's not what that verse is saying. It's saying God is doing what is right and good and best for you. When you love your kids, you're doing it because it's what's best for them. It doesn't always feel warm and fuzzy, but it's right. God is love. He always is working for our good and our best. Therefore, there's no fear when we come to know the one who is love and we are filled with him and his love and his grace surrounds us. And we're not holding on to anything in this world. As, as John says it, but perfect love 
fully realized, grown up in, completely let go of the world, and I'm all in with God, and I'm not worried about anything because he's with me, and he's got this. When we are walking in that place, I'm not there yet. Paul said, I'm not there yet, right? But there, we get the concept, right? Perfect love, when we, when we aspire and we're surrounded by that, it drives out all fear. There is no fear. As our awareness, this is what discipleship and walking with God and gathering with his people and pressing into the word and worshiping and continuing to choose God every day, this is what it grows in us. As our awareness of the magnitude and the depth and the scope and the faithfulness of God's love, the, the grip of God's love grows stronger on us. The grip of this world and the things that it would threaten us with that would make us fearful, the more that loses its grip on us. So we can find ourselves like Moses walking out of the Pharaoh's palace, letting go of Prince of Egypt or whatever else this world had wrapped around us. As the Hebrew writer later would say, letting go of everything that entangles in the sin that so easily you know, trips us up. Letting go of it. All in with God. Not fearful. You know what that does when you walk surrendered to God like that? It sets you free. It, 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 it lives or enables you to live freely and boldly for Jesus without worry of what this world may do. Greatest example in the world of that, Jesus. He just followed the Father. He wasn't worried. And man, the more that grows up in us, the more we can live like that. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27b. He persevered, Moses. He persevered, he overcame, he pressed through, he was victorious in the challenges that he faced because he saw him who is invisible. Just another reference. He, he didn't live by sight, he lived by faith. He kept his eyes fixed on, on the Father. All in, one way. Ambassadors for God. Moses fixed his eyes on God and it carried him through every challenge. And so here's what it all comes down to this morning for us. What challenges are you facing right now? What seems really hard? What are you worried about? What are you talking about all the time? <laughs> what is this thing that's just, it's just getting you and it's a challenge and it's hard? In that, in the midst of that challenge, where is your attention fixed? Is it on God? Is it on the fact that he's bigger? Is it on the fact that his love has got this? Surrendered to him? Or are you fixated on the issue, the problem? That's a recipe for stress. <laughs> um, are you all in? Are you all in with Jesus today? Do you need to let go of something to go all in with Jesus today? Man, if you do, I encourage you to come and let his presence, his promises, his power, and his love grow in your life and see you through. If you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you've never said, yes, I want to follow him all the way. Come today. We're going to have communion in just a moment, and then Elliot's going to come up and he's going to close our service out. Right after that, I'll be right down here. I'd love to pray with you and help you take whatever step the Lord's calling you to take today. Maybe you just need to say, you know what? I've just kind of got my eyes off the target and I need to recommit. I'd love to pray about that. Maybe there's just something going on in your life and you just, you just want to pray. Whatever it is, please come. I'd love to for pray with you up here right after we dismiss. Come on up. All right, right now, let's just bow our heads. Go to the Lord and spend a moment with him in prayer. Father, I'm just really overwhelmed in this moment with the awareness that when we get there, when we're with you, if we have, I don't know if we'll remember this world. I, 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 don't, I don't know. But if there's any memory of this world, I'm sure we will all look at each other and say, oh, why did we ever worry? Why did we stress? He had it in control all the time. 
Why didn't I go in all the way sooner? Help us in this moment, in in, in light of that, to choose right now to go all in. There is no life like a life set free. And you told us that if you set us free, we are free indeed. Through and through, from the core of our heart to the tips of our fingers. Oh, Lord, help us to be free today. Help us to do whatever we need to do. Let go of whatever we need to let go of. Recommit to whatever we need to recommit to today. To be all that you want us to be and that we want to be in you. Thank you for Jesus. In his name, Lord, we pray. Amen.